Good morning everyone and today in otolaryngeology or EMT our topic of discussion is sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus. So first of all as an introduction uh, the topic is basically to discuss sensory neural hearing loss but uh, and that is like to tell you about the causes of sensory neural hearing loss plus tinnitus which is a symptom and a sign also but we will discuss it but to tell you about the hearing loss like i did not write over here sensory neural hearing loss rather i wrote hearing loss because i want to give you an introduction about what is hearing loss and uh, then, of course, uh, we are going to talk about uh, the causes of sensory neural hearing loss. So, <coughs> one very important thing to understand before starting the topic is you must know the normal um, central pathways of hearing or of balance vestibular system. To understand completely how sensory neural hearing loss it happened so I would like to show you this thing these are the pathways they are showing you and now I don't know like how much you know about amplitude or latency and I'm not expert in this thing as well because, uh, of course, uh, this is all, you can say, the field of audiology. Uh, I just know some simple definitions like uh, what, is a, what is sound, that, you know, sound is a form of energy which is produced by vibrating objects. And simply that vibrations it, it comes pass through the external auditory meatus and they hit the tympanic membrane which basically transmit the sounds by the three um, ossicles which is um, malleus incus and stapes and anything and the stapes is again connected with the window and it moves the window which basically moves the fluid inside the cochlea so anything before that will can result into conductive hearing loss. So uh, you can see over here they are showing like the blue one as high frequency and the red one as low frequency. I think like the frequency is very easy to understand what is frequency. It is the number of cycles per second. And you know, we wrote it, we write it as herds. Now, uh, if you will talk about the pathways, uh, what is there, like, uh, or you can say the central pathways of hearing. So, simply in the cochlea, there is basically organ of corti, and the hair cells are there which have which are basically the receptor cells and in my first lecture about the anatomy I talk about that thing and simply these hair cells uh, are connected with uh, the cochlear division of the vestibulocochlear nerve or the eighth nerve and you can see like this is one is written so it is distal cochlear nerve then two is written which is proximal cochlear nerve and three is written over here which is basically cochlear nucleus and if you will see over here they are showing you the ear of one side of course there is one ear here as well but you will see the fibers they are going into the cerebral cortex or thus you can say the temporal lobe cortex where there is auditory area or acoustic area but the fibers are also crossing over to the opposite side and ascending as well 
and you can see like this is basically superior olivary nucleus so superior olivary nucleus you know it keep on ascending and basically what this thing is lateral lemniscus lateral lemniscus and this lateral lemniscus will first of all go into the inferior inferior colliculus and then to the medial geniculate body and then to the auditory cortex right so you can say this is the central pathway of the hearing why this thing is important remember guys if someone has stroke of this side he still will not become deaf in this ear why because the fibers of this one are also going on to the opposite side and the fibers from this ear are also giving dual innervation okay so that's why this is important to remember so uh, this auditory fibers they go to the ipsilateral as well as to the contralateral side and uh, each ear have connections in both the cerebrum cere cerebral hemispheres so this area which is written over here as acoustic area is basically is located into the superior temporal gyrus it is also called as broadman area 41 okay so there is a mnemonic to remember this thing that is you know e coli is the a causative organism for uh, the UTI for the GIT infection so this is basically E. coli ma so E is for the eighth nerve C is for cochlear nerve a uh, cochlear nuclei E uh, C O olivary nucleus this one L is lateral lemniscus I is inferior colliculus m is medial geniculate body and a is for auditory cortex so this is like you can say the pathways of hearing now why it is important to understand simply because if you don't know this thing of course we are discussing sensory neural hearing loss <clears throat> like the which is the topic by the way here you will see the amplitude and the latency by the way, what we do is called as audiogram, audiograms to test for the hearing these days. Of course, there is Weber's and Rennie's test for hearing as well. But we also do audiometry. So, when we perform audiometry, we must be knowing a lot or like the, because why I'm talking about this is because uh, when you will study the book you will you will study like you know there is something called as pure tone audiometry and things like that. for like what is pure tone is uh, when a sound have a single frequency so a single frequency sound is called as a pure tone uh, so whenever sound have more than one frequencies we co call it as complex sound and frequency is measured in hertz but how we perceive it and define it we call it as pitch so you can say pitch is the subjective sensation which is produced by frequency so okay now uh, this is the amplitude and this one is the latency right uh, now there is something called as intensity intensity is uh, basically like how loud is the sound or you can say intensity is the measurement of the strength of the sound the power of the sound and how we say that you know you are talking too loud so it means you are talking too much forcefully or the intensity of your sound is very high so intensity is measured in decibels okay you can see over here decibels 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 right now see 
when someone have slight hearing loss so see this intensity is damaged but someone who have a severe hearing loss see 71 to 90 decibel is gone right for example any sound which is 120 decibel or more it causes pain in the ear so this is decibel decibel again deci is like one tenth of bell bell is the unit so decimal is basically one tenth of bell and bell comes from the same guy you know alexander graham bell who invented the telephone so uh, then there are many other things you know what is noise and uh, noise is simply you can say it's like uh, a sound which have different frequencies different intensities and it is unpleasant to the ear okay so uh, of course like there is a lot a lot a lot of what you can say uh, physics behind that you can say and very hard to explain in one lecture especially and of course like the audiologists are those who understand this thing so coming back to the hearing loss guys there is two pathways one is the conductive pathway which is not shown over here one is the neural pathway which i explained you and again there are two types of hearing loss one is sensory hearing loss one is or sensory neural hearing loss why it is called a sensory neural like either the neural pathway is damaged or either the receptors are damaged so sensory neural hearing loss or either it could be conductive hearing loss right so simply there or it could be mixed type the third can be mixed both of them right so again like i'm, I'm just giving you some concept before starting the main lecture now what i want from you guys is to either read if you get the things better by reading or either see some video about how to do webers and Rennie test because simply again before starting the main topic for example this one is like how they give us the results Okay, like uh, this is called as audiometry, right? This is called as audiometry. Now, simply, what is the important thing over here is that uh, what they do is uh, they check. Um, the frequency and the hearing level okay and they give us the results like this and this is how nowadays uh, they see like either someone have deafness or not for example there is something called as pure tone audiometry so what they do like they give a low intensity level of sound which a patient can hear okay 50 percent of the time so they give like different intensity sounds like you can say different frequency sounds like 250 500 then 1000 then 2000 then 4000 then 8000 like this right so and how they check for the air conduction thresholds they do it by headphones they measure outer middle inner ear pressures and things like this okay so they have like these type of measures so then they calculate it by a uh, thing on the basis of you can say pure tone average PTA but again like you know uh, uh, you can say um, this one is uh, this one is like they are showing for the conductive hearing loss right so of course like conductive hearing loss means like there is some problem with the conduction like otitis media can cause right or like for example uh, autosclerosis can cause so this one is like the photograph for that this one is for mixed hearing loss okay so now 
uh, then there is something called a speech audiometry. What is speech audiometry? Uh, basically, the, this is like the lowest hearing level at which the patient is able to repeat 50% of the words which they are given to them. So, of course, like they, they, they give some sort of speech to the patient and they ask them to repeat that. Okay. Then there is something called a speech discrimination test. And nowadays, they also have something called as impedance audiometry. So what is impedance audiometry? Uh, you can say they can check the pressure uh, differences uh, or we call it as tympanogram. Okay, they see like how much tympanic membrane is responding to that. So anyhow, uh, nowadays like a lot of audiograms are available and uh, there is something called as uh, uh, auditory brainstem response, you know. They, they give a uh, some stimulus and they check the like either they see any response the brainstem or not right so uh, so like you know uh, uh, in the children before discharging the baby from the hospital they always do a test and they just put something near the ear and they say okay the baby hearing is fine so like they are doing this thing they are they are picking up the same thing so anyhow uh, uh, our topic of, is, of course, sensory, sensory neural hearing loss. And guys, remember, we are discussing sensory neural hearing loss. We are not discussing deafness. But deafness, for example, you know, this one is like WHO defines disabling hearing impairment in children under, under the age of 15 years as an unaided hearing threshold level in the better year of 31 decibel. Okay. So... Of course, these things are difficult to define because normal hearing, again, maybe me and you hear the things different or at, um, you can say, with different type of uh, loudness, okay? So, a person has sufficient hearing to understand speech under adequate listening conditions. Now, you can see like deafness is a hearing loss that is so severe that a child has difficulty processing linguistic information and hearing loss is like when someone have uh, is under the definition of deafness but they have like loss of hearing okay so this thing now uh, I will show you multiple things for example see this one this is like the slight impairment moderate impairment severe impairment and profound one they are given like the decibels loss okay and they are showing the performance of these and recommendations what to do for example anyone who have profound hearing loss provide them with hearing aids right or uh, you can see again this one the same one degree of hearing loss none mild moderate moderate to severe severe and profound so simply uh, whatever is there remember like 90 above loud 91 plus decibel loss is like profound hearing loss in which like even the amplified speech is unclear so this is severe normal speech is inaudible moderate to severe clarity of speech is consider considerably affected 51 to 40, 41 to 55 difficulty understanding speech especially in the presence of background noise and whenever they watch tv or radio you know they make it like the sound very loud and 26 to 40 difficulty hearing soft speech and conversation. So like they will keep on saying, can you speak a little louder? And uh, 0 to 25 decibel hearing loss, like there is no difficulty in going around. So like that's why we call it as none. So how we define hearing loss is like organic and inor inorganic or non-organic, of course, like when there is no organic cause and organic can be divided into conductive as well as sensory neural Conductive, there are many like uh, uh, if someone have uh, otitis externa, someone have vex, someone have block of the canal, someone have autosclerosis, someone have otitis media, cholesteatoma or any conditions. And sensory neural can be sensory when the cochlea is damaged or neural. And neural can be the nerve which is the nerve for can be the problem with the central auditory pathway so this is how we go for the classification right now these are the characteristics of conductive hearing loss okay 
um, as you know our discussion is sensory neural hearing loss so I would rather uh, of course I will send you the PPT uh, and uh, what you will be doing like the PPT is quite detailed you can say so you can found a lot of information in the PPT but you know uh, in you know our one lecture is around uh, 40 minutes plus 40 minutes you can say 120 minutes you know it is not possible guys uh, to go through all the PPT okay and talk about everything of course in this one so I will be staying or you can say um, going with uh, the causes of sensory neural hearing loss with the uh, tinnitus right thing so sensory neural hearing loss have a lot of what you can say causes right um, now uh, you can say like what is the size of the problem like that what WHO says and recent increase uh, why there is increase in sensory neural type of hearing loss but anyhow how we divide sensory neural hearing loss is uh, under this headings it could be congenital and it could be acquired so whenever it is congenital of course it is present in the birth at the time of the birth and of course like there is some problem with the inner ear or you can say the organ of corti or if there could be some damage to the uh, you can say central systems so now they say like it could be syndromic or non syndromic syndromic means like those uh, type of uh, um, hearing losses genetic hearing losses or congenital hair losses with which like they are associated with some syndromes there is a syndrome called as Alport syndrome or there is a syndrome uh, other type of syndromes are also there so simply what is there like uh, they are associated with some kind of sort of syndromes right and non syndromic like which is like they're, they're not in association with syndrome rather they come alone right uh this thing now uh, whenever it is acquired it have a lot of causes okay you can see like the congenital genetic hereditary sensory neural hearing loss syndromic so you can see like there is a lot of syndromes right i was talking about this one alports and uh, these are the non syndromic for example there is something called as autosomal dominant sensory neural hearing loss then there is something called as uh, you can say x-linked sensory neural hearing loss or there is uh, something autosomal recessive sensory neural hearing loss which is the, like the common one so anyhow uh, what is the thing of course there is hearing loss and it is present congenitally and uh, non-genetic causes or embryopathies can occur due to any like you know you are studying pediatrics as well so it could be as a result of anything like uh, aplasia could be as a result of infections could be as a result of water toxic drugs or could be as a result of trauma and if you will see the acquired causes now so one thing is called as idiopathic sensory neural hearing loss okay then there could be labyrinthitis like in which there is inflammation to the labyrinth labyrinth then there could be autotoxicity like especially the drugs which is caused which are autotoxic then there could be cochlear autosclerosis sclerosis in the cochlea there could be trauma to the inner ear or even trauma to the Eighth cranial nerve. Um, then there is noise induced hearing loss. Then there could be perinatal asphyxia and connectors. Press by cusis is basically the hearing loss of the old age. You know, the old people they cannot uh, listen properly, uh, like their, their hearing capacity goes down by age. We call it as press by cusis. It could be superative otitis media okay this one is not so important rather you can say there could be infections to the labyrinths which is over here it could be viral bacterial or spirochetal then 
endolymphatic hydrops then acoustic neuroma which is the tumor of the eighth nerve then there is uh, uh, what you can say okay leave this thing I should use hearing loss well do the thing okay now there could be many other causes like systemic viral infections like bumps measles systemic bacterial infections perilymphistolas metabolic vascular lesions of the inner ear so simply there are many conditions okay i would like to add over here something called as uh, meniere's disease because our next topic is that one as well so they also get right the same so uh, now one of the cause of uh, this acquired causes is also called as familial progressive sensory neural hearing loss okay so all these things can cause neural hearing loss okay so now uh, instead of talking about you know uh, again i'm scrolling it down i told you i will give you the ppt and you can get a lot of information for example autotoxic drugs you know never forget about a drug called like the amino glycoside group like gentasen they are autotoxic okay so you can see like they have given the list of all the drugs and chemicals and again the first one is amino glycoside so this is the, of course the most important one cytotoxic agents industrial chemicals polypeptide epitabitic so all these are important but of course this one makes the most important one okay so autotoxic drugs can be there and uh, uh, and now of course like there is the explanation of all these things right uh, I'm not going to go in detail but remember like this one streptomycin, amikacin, canamycin, neomycin all this like amino glycosides are cochleotoxic they are toxic to the ear so whenever we give them of course like we give them in in the therapeutic index or in the safe limits because they are autotoxic other than that you can see over here uh, diuretics are also making the important one furosemide bumetanide ethacrylic acid all these drugs so again like guys there are many chemicals there are many drugs which can cause hearing loss okay but now, now this one like of course like they are not so common salicylates basically causes more tinnitus than bilateral sensory neural hearing loss okay so of course like you will get a lot of drugs over here uh, what I, I will be talking about more is how to approach these patients. I think that's make the important part. If we know how we approach these patients, may will make more sense. Okay. Now, uh, uh, you will see like press by cusis now. Now, press by cusis is basically um, the hearing loss of... Uh, old age okay it is what you can say it is the hearing loss which is by you can due to physiological aging okay so of course like you, these are the elder people who can have like this thing in six decade onwards okay and uh, there are many reasons or predisposing factors like smoking noise exposure environmental factors alcoholism high stroke blood pressure blood hyperviscosity all these play a role but blood press but press by courses is the uh, uh, you can say the physiological aging okay to many of you like I remove one thing something called as NOHL which is basically non-organic hearing loss I I I remove it purposefully why because uh, that is the 
non-organic causes, right? So they must come here. So, for example, someone who is who is uh, malingering, okay, or faking up like the deafness, of course, like that comes in this in this category. But like, I'm not going to discuss that now, okay? So that's the important thing, okay? Okay, now. Um, other than press by who says, uh, I don't think so. We have to discuss like anything in detail. Like familial progressive sensory neural hearing loss is simply again a genetic disorder and it's a pro progressive degeneration of the cochlea which is going on. Okay, noise induced hearing loss is quite interesting. Noise induced hearing loss is basically whenever you are exposed to a loud noise so there are basically different types you can see one thing is called a TTS that is temporary threshold shift so what is this one when someone have exposed to a loud noise so what happened their threshold shift for a while but it is reversible it comes back and sometimes there could be a permanent threshold shift in which like the shift is permanent and this noise induced hearing loss can be due to acute exposure can be due to chronic exposure uh, for example if you will see like someone who is working in a market where or in factories where there is too much noise so what happens they keep on sh speaking talking loudly over there and their ears become used to that and whenever they come out from that environment they usually start hearing the things louder okay so there could be sudden hearing loss there could be you can say noise trauma I like this is a you know a chart given very interesting one you know see the normal conversation they take in this group in this uh, range and these are you can say see 150 gunshot firecracker grain dryer chainsaw rock band so like they are talking about like you have given what you can say how different sounds you know and their uh, range or their uh, intensity okay how much decibel sound is there Okay, so uh, these are basically the hypothesis like why there is noise induced hearing loss, right? So anyhow, um, there could be idiopathic sudden hearing loss as well. And of course, like it's idiopathic, so we don't know the cause, but it too occurs. Um, and you can see over here, 30 decibel or more sensory neural hearing loss at least in three consecutive frequencies occurring in less than three days. This is the definition here. This is like the medical emergency because we have to exclude different things by history, clinical examination, investigations, and MRI. So we have to rule out these things. Uh, now, non-organic hearing loss, guys, see malingering and all this stuff, of course. Anyhow, now, what I wanted to talk tell you is this thing, basically. I think if you know the causes, the important thing is how to approach. See, first of all, we go for the history. And if you know the causes, you can ask, like, about their profession, uh, you know, about their age, about the onset, about the family history. Okay. Then we check, like, either the severity of the deafness is mild, moderate, severe or severely profound or totally deaf and we can send them for audiometry and then like the type of audiogram whatever losses in high frequency low frequency mid frequency or flat type so you can see uh, then we check the site of the lesion then we go for the laboratory test and of course like in laboratory test it depends on what things you get in the history and examination then you will think about either to do a CT scan either you have 
to see for any bone destruction like due to polysteatoma, glomus tumor, middle ear malignancy, acoustic neuroma, blood counts, blood sugar levels, serology for syphilis, thyroid function tests and kidney function tests. Just to found all these things. Okay. Okay. This is, thing is very important guys. I would request you to watch any video. It will make your concept good for this thing. And uh, see. Uh, again like how different sounds sound like this is like pure tone audiometry I explained the thing during the start okay uh, now management so management in management of course uh, uh, if there is anything which we is reversible we will reverse it if anything is not reversible of course you have to do some sort of what you can say uh, oral rehabilitation see early detection early rehabilitation especially in the babies because otherwise they will be having uh, problem with their language development syphilis is treatable hypothyroidism is treatable labyrinthitis is treatable many diseases manageable and sensory neural hearing loss due to perilymph fistula can be corrected surgically. So simply, uh, the extract of this slide is like treat what is reversible, right? Autotoxic drugs should be uh, stopped, and uh, we will uh, noise induced hearing loss. Like ask the patient person to change his job or wear some ear protective uh, buds. Okay. And rehabilitation so nowadays guys uh, simply uh, here you will see uh, like the causes of sudden hearing loss which is a medical emergency like infections trauma vascular ear toxic drugs neoplastic miscellaneous and psychogenic so of course like treat them so anyhow uh, we give the patients hearing aids okay uh, now, you know, uh, one thing is called as oral rehabilitation. Depending on the degree of hearing loss, communication requirements, motivations, expectations, and mental disabilities, we decide what to do. But simply, whenever someone has hearing loss, we can give them the high he he hearing aids. These are, you know, BTE, behind the ear. This one is ETE, in the ear, hearing aids. This one is ITC in the canal and this one is CIC or completely in the canal type of hearing aids, okay? And I, I, I know like you have seen many people, they are wearing this thing, of course. And nowadays, they are doing the cochlear implants as well. And I know one person who got it done from the UK. Of course, expensive, but new and... Uh, what they do like they insert the electrodes in the cochlea to allow, allow the direct stimulation of this auditory nerve and uh, simply you know this is the newest thing again like they they are showing the surgery of that cochlear implant anyhow uh, this is all about uh, hearing our next topic is tinnitus now, tinnitus is uh, an interesting topic. Why? Because uh, uh, I am sure like all of you had experienced tinnitus uh, repeatedly for a few minutes or for a few seconds or maybe for a few days, right? So what is tinnitus? It's basically ringing of sound or the perception of sound in the ear when nothing is there or in the absence of external stimuli. So tonight is like from where the word comes, it could be buzzing, hissing, roaring, clicking or pulsatile sound. So anyhow, of course for some, it becomes so unbearable when it, whenever it is chronic that the people, they literally commit suicide or they become depressed, okay? Just because of tinnitus so tinnitus may be unilateral maybe bilateral now 
the it will be it can be originating in the ears or around the head okay or it could be a symptom of some other disease now tinnitus it affects a lot of people and it is like the prevalence is equal in the males and females there are two types of tinnitus one is subjective and one is objective subjective is more common and subjective is the one in which the person the patient can feel it only can can hear it only objective when the sound is can be hear by the patient himself and even the examiner can also see so it is often pulsatile i will you would understand what is objective like when you being the examiner being the doctor can hear that tinnitus which the patient is complaining we call it as objective okay pulsatile tinnitus so what is pulsatile tinnitus tinnitus when the tinnitus it matches the pulse like when you will put your hand with the radial so the patient or the person who is examining hear the sound with the pulse okay and it is mostly due to turbulent blood flow through para auditory structures and it is vascular etiology due to the movement of the blood now see this is the causes of objective tinnitus so objective tinnitus is the one which both can hear the patient as well as the examiner see mostly it is due to either vascular problems pulsatile type or due to muscular problems av malformation vascular tumors sometimes it is venous hum due to thyrotoxicosis pregnancy anemia atherosclerosis ectopic carotid artery or some some people have persistent stepedial artery inside the ear or vascular lobes and anyone who have myoclonus or stepedial muscle spasm now this one of course like maybe to the examiner it is not so much clearly here but simply we can pick up the sound by special devices okay so now i will tell you about uh, uh subjective one subjective tinnitus okay you can see that there is a lot of causes of tinnitus okay like the persons who are having hearing loss like presbycosis noise exposure okay sometimes see when you are exposed to a very loud sound what you have in your ear after that loud sound for example if you fire a bullet from from a gun right after firing your ear will enter into a you can say into a dull zone like you will hear something like like this okay or something like that t sometimes for sure like we are sitting and you know suddenly like there is something a ringing sound in our ear like ting like so that's tinnitus so it could be due to presbycosis noise exposure otosclerosis middle ear effusion many diseases we will we are going to study it in the in our last lecture which is next week acoustic neuroma or toxic drugs or substances neurological causes like multiple sclerosis head trauma metabolic causes can be there it they occur in thyroid disorders hyperlipidemia vitamin b12 deficiency it could be associated with psychiatric problems like depression and anxiety and by the way someone who have tinnitus for so long they can develop depression and anxiety and it could be due to infections like syphilis meningitis and now guys see if you know the causes you know how to talk to the patient you know how to take history and you know how to investigate what investigation should be done and what uh, question should be asked so see in the history you will ask about first of all the onset the progression the aggravating the relieving factors and also you will ask about the associated symptoms you will ask about the quality of the tinnitus pitch loudness either it's unilateral either it's bilateral either it's constant either it's intermittent either it is associated with the hearing loss vertigo otalgia otoria then you will ask about the infections trauma noise exposure medication usage 
medical history, hearing loss, vertigo. So see, if you know the causes, guys, if you know the causes of uh, the objective as well as the subjective tinnitus, you would understand why we are covering these things, right? So, after that, we go for the physical examination. And in this one, you will see either it is objective or it is subjective. So, of course, like if it is yeah, the objective one in which like you can also hear, it could be most probably vascular, muscular type of issue. But if only the patient is hearing, then of course, we do a complete head to neck exam, general physical exam. We go for otoscopy. We search for audible brewery in pulsatile tinnitus auscultate over orbits, mastoid process, skull, neck, heart using bell and diaphragm of, di of, of stethoscope, okay. So a uh, Tony B tube is like simply a small tube like you can auscultate the external auditory canal. I don't know like if I can found it over here or not but I will see, okay. So uh, Let's see if we can found, yeah, small one like this, okay. So this is like to auscultate the ear, right. So now, uh, simply, uh, this is a very small tube to auscultate the external auditory canal. Uh, so uh, now, if it, it seems like to be vascular in origin, we can ask the person to do physical exercise so a light exercise can increase pulsatile tinnitus light pressure on the neck decreases the venous hum of course due to pressure changes well salva maneuver decreases venous hum and turning the head decreases venous hum and then we can send the patient for audiometry Weber and any test can be done and different tests can be done. Now, of course, like the investigations are not just limited to these things, but if you know the causes of subjective as well as subjective tinnitus, guys, there are many tests we can do. For example, we can check for hematocrit levels, syphilis testing, thyroid uh, testing, blood biochemistries, lipid profiles can be done, vitamin B12 level, zinc levels can be done, and not forgetting the imagings, okay, especially in pulsatile tinnitus, CT scan for the temporal bone, skull base, okay, all the things can be done. MRI can be done as well. So, all these things can be done. They are showing the globus uh, tympanica in imaging. So, uh, all the things can be done. Glomus jugular rail, you know, when there is erosion of the jugular fossa. So you can see like, of course, on MRI, they can catch the jugular fossa. So imaging can be done simply. And we can catch the atriovenous malformations and all the stuff, right? On contrasted CT scan and MRI. Okay, guys, so acoustic neuroma is very, 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 we can catch, you know, like this is very important to remember in imaging. So see, the big acoustic neuroma which is causing a lot of pressure inside the internal areas again they are showing you the acoustic neuroma over here right so simply you can see diagnostic approach to the tinnitus so we will any patient who's coming with tinnitus we take history physical examination and audiometry uh, see if it's objective ENT referral pulsatile CT MRI vascular etiology is found continuous is there MRI most probably it is petalous eustachian tube, palatal myoclonus or stapedial muscle spasm. Very easy to know this thing. If it is subjective, we check either it's unilateral or bilateral. Unilateral, normal ear examination, MRI with vertigo and deafness alone. Think about menial disease and acoustic neuroma. If it is abnormal ear examination, so of course it could be wax infection. Whenever it is bilateral, it could be head trauma, it could be 
associated with hearing loss it could be associated with no hearing loss so whenever whenever there is tinnitus which is bilateral with hearing loss autosclerosis i told you it happened in females upon pregnancy presbycosis which i told you is which is the normal physiological hearing loss of old age or it could be due to medications or noise whenever it, there is no hearing loss associated with bilateral tinnitus then metabolic causes and psychogenic causes should be seen so again like this is a very good flow chart or the approach to tinnitus how we diagnose so guys how to treat tinnitus now see first of all uh, you can see over here you know multiple treatments are there avoidance of dietary stimulants like coffee tea and cola smoking cessation avoid medications known to cause tinnitus reassurance and white noise from radio or home masking machines okay so uh, masking machines like the who which can keep on producing one type of sound and it basically masks the sound so of course like uh, it's not always the treatment by the way but um, you can see the poss only possibility but like of course different things can be tried and uh, now uh, what i wanted to mention over here uh okay before going in more like i will i will i will talk like this way that they, you know if the cause is found and the cause is reversible treat that if the cause is uh, reversible treat that okay so of course like this is the most important one now what the research says that with no treatment or with no treatable causes 50% of the patient improve 25% become worse and 25% remain the same okay so see half of the patients they improve one fourth they become worse with time one fourth remain the same okay now uh, we also ask them to um, you can say noise hygiene or sound hygiene there is tinnitus clinic as well you know in developed world there is tinnitus clinics as well okay so in that one you know they basically educate them on these things right avoid these things avoid noisy places avoid any auto toxic drugs all the things they say okay so uh now you know one of the thing is that uh, maybe if you are busy and if you are working in some office where there is some background noises there so of course like maybe it will not disturb you a lot but if you whenever like you will come back you will lay down to sleep of course that tinnitus is going to disturb you a lot or you simply you can say it disturbs more in the um quiet environment okay so whenever like someone is in quiet environment you know we can create some background noise to avoid that for example you can play music you can play a tv okay like this way so treatment in medications you can see um many medications have been researched for the treatment of tinnitus intravenous lidocaine suppresses tinnitus but it is impractical to use clinically of of course we cannot use now tocanamide okay sorry this the spelling is tocanamide is a oral analog which is ineffective okay the trials are still going on carbamazepine is ineffective may cause bone marrow suppression so you can say like not much um you can say success is there or we do don't have much options okay of course like they are depressed they are anxiety we can prescribe them with alprazolam but for a short duration nortriptyline and amitriptyline which are tcas or tricyclic antidepressants they may have some benefits okay leave this thing guys you know this is like the reference of the researches 
विचर के बनोवर हैं एस एस आर आईज जिनको बायलोबा यू नो मैनी थिंग्स दे हैव ट्राइड बट नन इज सिंपली प्रूवन इफेक्टिव ओके नाउ द ट्रीटमेंट इज वी कैन गिव दम हेयरिंग एड्स ओके amplification of background noise can decrease tinnitus like that again same masking techniques or we can use some maskers like produce sound to mask tinnitus there is something called as tinnitus instrument instrument as well it is combination of hearing aid and a masker they combine these two and they call it as what tinnitus instrument okay so this is one of the thing they they have then we have tinnitus retraining therapies and of course like uh, it is not like this like everyone will be benefited or will be completely cured not like this but they use a combination of masking with low level broadband sound noise for several hours per day and counseling to achieve habituation so they they, they make you live with this thing right so of course like not like this like the, everyone will be getting getting benefit to that then there is a technique called as electrical stimulation of the cochlea so what they do they they do a transcutaneous stimulation okay so again they have tried this thing there are cochlear implants also so like you know most of the things okay now the important things surgeries for the treatable cause like atrial venous malformation globus tumors otosclerosis acoustic neuroma of course surgery and proven benefits of course okay now uh, the treatments you know could be biofeedback hypnosis magnetic stimulation acupuncture conflicting reports of benefits for all these things guys right but um, one of the thing you know which they had tried is uh, uh, what they do is basically they destroy the cochlea as well sometimes but not here like in many years disease we are going to discuss that so the conclusion is simply tinnitus is common problem with an extensive differentials need to identify medical process if involved pulsatile or non pulsatile is important distinction of course these are treatable very important to see either they are unilateral or bilateral very important to see if there is any having any hearing loss or vertigo thorough examination and audiometry testings are very important so in general tinnitus that is pulsatile unilateral and associated with other unilateral otorhagic system is more worrisome and should warrant ent referral of course to the patient so that because like these are mostly with the reversible causes and these are mostly which are treatable simply right so guys again uh, uh, even in the next lecture we will be talking about one condition and more of the symptoms and more about how to approach vertigo how to approach like uh, sensory neural hearing loss and today we have discussed how to approach tinnitus how to take history how to do physical examination what are the investigations we can do and treatment options you have seen and nothing is proven with a clear benefit but they they have tried a lot of things some things work in some some things don't work in some and some some people half of the people they become good one fourth of the people they become bad one for fourth of the people they become they remain same so thank you so much guys for listening and i will see you in the next lecture